Hi ladies, my name is Cindy Nick and I'm so excited to be bringing you the word today. Um, and we are going to be talking about 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 15. And as you know, we've been doing our Search the Word study. And before we dive into those scriptures today, I want to take just an opportunity to share with you something that God laid on my heart as we begin this study. Um, I love Bible study and I just, you know, I can't wait till the next Bible study starts each time, but I have to tell you that this Bible study was different. When we started this Bible study, I immediately said, you know, Lord, there is something special I'm, I'm supposed to learn. And so I want to share with you sort of an analogy that God laid on my heart. And my expectations, of course, when we started the Bible study were to grow in my faith, to learn some new Bible study strategies, to, um, to have a closer walk with the Lord and to be with my, uh, you know, to commune with other believers and women. And, and, you know, who doesn't love to hear, you know, a great Bible study teacher, right? And so I came in with expectations, but you know, I feel like my expectations were really low compared to what God really wanted to do in my life through this study. So what really happened was I realized um, after just a few pages into this search the word study that I had been spiritually snorkeling uh, for a very long time. So let me introduce to you this whole idea of spiritual snorkeling. First of all, I realized I was hanging out in the shallow water. I was pretty much settling for what was just on the surface. As I would go into my Bible studies, I was pretty content with, with what I could just see from, from, the, from the top level. But then I realized that, you know, I wasn't diving in deep enough to see what God really wanted to say to me and to allow him to truly use his word to transform and to change me. And that's when I realized, you know, I've got to go deeper. And this book has truly helped me with that. Um, there's a couple of reasons why I feel like I was spiritually snorkeling. First of all, it's easy. It's easier to snorkel than it is to, to dive deep. And secondly, it, it's safe. You know, it's safe up on the surface, right? You don't have to worry about all the things that are lurking beneath that, that might come to light if you go deeper. And so spiritually snorkeling was, snorkeling was pretty much satisfying um, my basic needs to get into what I call the water of the word and splash around a little bit and learn some, uh, some cool new things and some new scriptures. But then I realized that by doing that, my perspective was very limited and I could not see and did not know what was below the surface. Some of the reasons I may have avoided that deep water are pretty practical if you think about them. First of all, deep sea diving takes a lot more training. It takes a lot more commitment. It takes a lot more endurance to explore the unknown. When we go deeper, you know, we have to get some additional, um, you know, knowledge to help us to be successful at that. Secondly, um, diving deep is risky. You know, there may be uh, predators, um, there may be attacks. Um, I may be convicted of something. I may have to face some challenges along the way. Um, it's just, it's just harder. And I might see some things I don't want to see or find out some things I really don't want to know about myself if I go deeper. And then lastly, you know, um, the deeper you go in the ocean if you're deep sea diving, the more pressure there is. And I knew that if I went deeper, maybe there's going to be a lot of pressure for me to actually have to do some of these things that God is asking me to do. And so um, what I do know about deep sea, deep sea diving, though, and scuba diving as opposed to snorkeling is that all of the best stuff is below the surface. Sometimes when we stay on the top, we may get a glimpse of what's below, but we can't actually reach it and touch it. And we can't get um, you know, a good view of it. And by, by uh, deep sea diving, we're able to go deeper and see things that we would otherwise not be able to see. Um, I also know that the treasures are always at the bottom. And you know what happens when you find treasure, you want more treasure and you want to keep searching for treasure. And all of those nuggets of gold that God has for us in his word are, they're deeply embedded 
and we have to go into the depths of the word to be able to find them. And um, lastly, um, you know, when you get deep into God's word, you realize that it changes your view of the world, not only um, around you, but also above you and beneath you. So God reveals hidden things in the deep when we allow him to really work in our spirits. I want to tell a really quick story about once I took um, some of my family members, uh, we were in um, a Caribbean island and we said, you know, we wanted to go on this Atlantis submarine because this submarine would allow you to go 150 feet under the surface of the ocean. I had never even considered that, but I thought, what an awesome opportunity. So as we begin to, uh, to submerge, what I noticed is that um, the beautiful colors and the beautiful fish and all the things, as the deeper we got, they were still there, but they weren't colorful anymore. And it was dark. And the further down we went, the darker it got. But then I realized at one point, you know, I can't see all of the beautiful things I'm supposed to see. They're hidden. But then just like that, the submarine turned on lights. And as soon as they turned on the light and the light hit all of these beautiful creatures, they, they were colorful and, and beautiful and we could see what was hidden. And that is the way the Holy Spirit works in us and through us when we deep dive into the word and we pray and we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. It's like the light shines and that light is Jesus. That light is Jesus. And so I want to share with you uh, Daniel uh, chapter 2 verse 22, one of my favorite scriptures. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. So if we can have the courage to take that deep dive into the word, then he will use the Holy Spirit to shine a light on these hidden things that are in our lives that need to be exposed. Um, Job eleven seven. love this. Can you fathom the depths of God or discover the limits of the Almighty? What an amazing scripture. And then finally, Psalm 92, 5. O oh Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. There is a depth to God's character, and it cannot be assessed when we just pull a verse from the, the book, you know, any book in the Bible, just jerk a verse, as we sometimes say, um, because when we just quickly glance over scriptures, or we just study something so that we can check that box, I read this, I read this, I read this, I've done what I'm supposed to do, we will never know the depth if we don't get out of the shallows. So I am challenging you, this book, Search the Word, has challenged me to get out of the shallow water and to dive deep into God's Word, which is what we're going to do right now. Have just a few moments with you today, but I want to remind you that there are some handouts that go along with the scriptures that we're going to be covering in Timothy, and you can find those at greenacreswomen.org. And if you want to push pause right now and go get those and come back, I'll be waiting for you when you return. So at this point, I want to move on to 2 Timothy um, chapter 3, verse 1. And this is a hard lesson today. It's not one that everybody gets all excited about hearing about. And, and as I was studying this, I realized that, you know, uh, Lord, this is hard. This is hard to talk about because it required a lot of self-reflection. Um, a lot of times I, I've always said, you know, if you really want to learn something, then teach it. And if you do commit to teaching it, then realize that you're going to be uh, illuminating and shining the light on your own, you know, situations. And so this has been very enlightening for me, but also um, has really helped me to understand you know, what the elements of pride can do and how dangerous they are to our Christian walk. But there's good news, so stay tuned for that good news. So let's look at 2 Timothy 3, 1. This know also that in the last days, perilous times will come. And, you know, I'm using the King James Version for that because I want to focus on the word perilous for just a moment. Um, perilous in the Greek is kalepos. And that word means extremely violent, fierce, very dangerous, risky, hazardous, unsafe. It's kind of scary, kind of like going into that deep water here. But I will say 
There's only one other time in the Bible when that word perilous is used that way, and it's in reference to Matthew 8, 28, when um, Jesus came into the country of the Gadardines, and basically there were two demon-possessed men there who were so fierce no one could even pass by them. Um, they were violent. They could have possibly killed you. Um, they broke chains, and they were uncontrollable. And that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. These times are going to be fierce. They're going to be difficult, perilous, dangerous. And I think that puts it in perspective. So um, I also want to point out that in that first verse, uh, Paul is saying basically that this is going to occur in the last days. But let us remember and keep this in context that when Paul was discussing this with Timothy, they were indeed already in the beginning of the last days, and we are even further into the last days as I'm speaking you, to you today. So these things not only occurred or will occur in our time period, but they were also already occurring in the days of Paul and Timothy. It's just that they are going to get more intense. Let's look at how Paul describes these perilous times. There's some key things here that he uses. And so we're going to be reading 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 2 through 5, and this is in the NIV. People will be lovers of themselves. And I want to just stop right there. Paul starts with lovers of themselves, and it's not a coincidence that he starts with this. It's because this particular... Um, characteristic is going to be the reason for all of the rest of the characteristics that are to follow. For example, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power that goes along with that. Um, he finishes out this verse with have nothing to do with such people. And you know, a lot of times you, you know, you may read that and you think, well, does that mean I'm supposed to avoid all sinners? Well, absolutely not. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But what it is saying is you need to recognize these people for who they are. They are trying to deceive you. They are false prophets. They are teaching things that are going to distract you and take you down a pathway that you don't want to go. And so Paul is warning Timothy that this is going to occur. Um, if you look at the opposite of the meaning of some of these words, you will notice that many of them are actually the fruits of the Spirit. So when we are operating... Um, in the spiritual realm that we should be, we should be producing fruit and those fruits and those things like meekness and gentle, gentleness and love, those are, and self-control, those are the opposite of what Paul is saying um, in um, two through five. So these are godless traits. They will characterize false teachers and Timothy is specifically told to steer clear and we have to do the same thing. If you look on your worksheet, you'll see a space where it says lovers of self, also known as, and the word there is pride. And I want to emphasize something. This is a different kind of pride than when you're proud of your family members or your grandkids or you're proud of an accomplishment or you're proud of the work that you're doing uh, in the church or for the Lord. This is different. This kind of pride is driven by a love of self. The motivation behind the kind of pride we're talking about today is evil. It comes from a, a place that is not of God. The spaces that I've given you to fill in the blank, it's pretty easy today because basically pride goes in all of those spaces. Pride is the root of every other sin. It is rooted in worldliness. It is the devil's most destructive and effective tool. It is natural. We we don't have to work on loving ourselves. We just naturally love ourselves. It's part of our sinful nature. It's part of our fallen nature that we are self-centered. And um, as we know, um, it was this sin of pride that caused God to cast Lucifer out of heaven. 
It was the sin of pride that caused Adam and Eve to sin in the garden and got them kicked out of the garden. So basically, pride was the beginning of most every other sin that occurs in our world today. C.S. Lewis describes pride as anti-God state of mind, and that is so true. And he also said it is an utmost evil. And I don't know about you, but when I think of pride in my life possibly becoming something evil, that makes me want to take a, a quick check. Um, pride is also the result of spiritual drift, which we will talk about in just a moment. And pride is when there's more of me and less of God. I have to decrease so that God can increase. It's just that simple. Um, there's a lot of examples in the Bible. I don't have time to go through all of them today, but I encourage you to seek out in the Word examples of pride in the Bible where entire nations have fallen, including kings, because of pride in their life, um, a self-love, a self-affirmation. Uh, for example, even the Israelites, as they once they had been um, freed from the Egyptians in slavery, they became prideful. And each time pride surfaced, they, they ran into trouble. And you can read that over again, over and over again in Exodus. Also, even Pharaoh, who at one time may have even considered allowing uh, the Hebrew children to be set free from slavery, he said no, strictly because of pride and even pride to the point of losing his own son. Um, the enemy, Satan's ultimate desire, is for the earth to create a man-centered culture, a man-centered culture that is completely apart from honoring God, and his ultimate mission is the elevation of the worship of man. In truth, pride is simply one thing. It is self-worship, which we know means Anything we worship outside of Christ or outside of God is idolatry. Pride is a form of idolatry. We, um, Paul says in 12, uh, Romans 12, 3, don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given us. So how do we measure ourselves sometimes? Well, unfortunately, we sometimes look in a very distorted mirror that causes us to measure ourselves by the standards of this world instead of by the standards that God has given us. This is very dangerous. And so the, the thing that we have to remember is that God has given us a standard to live by. And when we become more like the world and less like Jesus, we're going to see issues of pride arise pride arise in our lives. Um, I, want, I want to always bring up the fact that pride is not something that is simply just out in the world, but it can creep in. And when you have a chance, go ahead and read on through verses 6, 7, and 8, where Paul says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly, he calls them silly women, but he's basically referring to vulnerable, sinful people who are going to be misled with the lust of the false prophets and their message. We have to be careful because if we are not, sin can or pride can creep in even to our houses of worship and into the body of Christ. I uh, shared um, earlier today that I when I'm reading in the New Testament and I see the followers of Jesus who had been walking and talking with him and, and watching him and listening to him teach. And even the disciples of Jesus are arguing about who's going to be first master, who's going to be first in the kingdom, who, who gets to sit on the left, who gets to sit on the right. And Jesus just looks at them and he's like, and he says, he's like, none of you, the, the last shall be the last shall be first and the first shall be last and and you you know this lesson of humility is so uh, it's so forthright there when you realize that even the the followers who were closest to Jesus just didn't get it at the time that it's not about elevating yourself it's not about exalting yourself it's about allowing yourself to be humble so that God can exalt you in his due time uh, so how do you go, I, I mentioned spiritual drift earlier, how do you go from being a lover of God to being a lover of self? 
Well, you simply do it by drifting. The further you get away from God, the more self-centered you become because it's our nature to do that. So how do we prevent spiritual drift? Spiritual, a spiritual drift basically occurs when you do nothing. And, you know, I gave the analogy um, that I love to go to the beach, but I know one thing. If I set my things on the shore and I go out and I begin to float and I do nothing, then I'm going to notice that it's not going to take very long. I'm going to be a long way from where I started. And all I had to do was nothing. If I want to stay close to where I started and close to the Lord and close to God, I have to do something to keep myself in that position. I have to do something to anchor myself to that position. This word, the word of God, is our anchor from spiritual drift. Being with the body of Christ is our anchor. Being with other believers is our anchor. We have to be anchored to avoid spiritual drift. And some of the ways you can know if you are caught up in that current of spiritual drift, just look at your fruits. Are you self-indulgent? Is it all about you? Are you self-sufficient? Um, I like to say I can do all things through me instead of all things through Christ. That would be self-sufficient. And even self-pity can become um, a symbol of pride because it's still all about you. And so we have to recognize that um, pride comes in many different disguises. Self-righteous, I decide what's right and wrong. Self-serving, what's in it for me? Self-absorbed, I feel, I think, I need, again, I. Self-seeking, everything exists for my benefit, right? And self-promoting, I'm putting myself up on a pedestal. And one of the things that is so important is recognizing how pride can creep in even to God's work. Are you serving from a place of pride or a place of humility? What is your motivation? Um, people can lead worship out of a place of pride. You can teach or preach out of a place of pride. You can do mission work out of a place of pride. Pretty much anything that you can do for the Lord, if your heart is not right and your motivation is not pure, it can become a source of pride. And we have to battle that because, again, it's our nature. So here's the good news as I wrap up. The, so there is a solution uh, to uh, pride, and it is humility. And I know you're thinking, oh, I don't want the Lord to humble me. I'm not going to pray to be humble because oof, who knows what might happen. But the Bible doesn't necessarily say to pray for the Lord to humble you, although he will if he needs to. It says in 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, Humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up, that he may exalt you in due time. And when that happens, what we notice is that our best example of humility is Jesus Christ. Study the life of Jesus Christ and you will see that just like in Philippians 2, 8 through 11, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He became a man. He experienced all the things that we experience he put himself in all of those positions. And even when he was tempted by the devil himself, he did not allow himself to become prideful, even under that temptation. So here are five ways to overcome pride and cultivate, we love that word, cultivate uh, humility in your life. First of all, surrender through repentance. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry, I've become prideful. I've allowed pride to creep in. And ask him to show you the areas of your life where pride has become uh, to, has began to manifest itself. Uh, seek for understanding. Dive in deep. Get out of the shallow water. Go deep and try to understand what God wants to say to you. Study his word. Serve others. One of the characteristics mentioned in verse 2 was um, being ungrateful. And if you serve others, it can certainly help you to have more gratitude and also to be more humble. And I will say this, that um, when you don't feel good about yourself and you are 
maybe dealing with some self-pity, which remember we said is a form of pride. Serving others is one of the best ways to come out of that because it allows you to do something out of a place um, of a servant's heart. Sowing seeds of gratitude. Think about all of the things that you are grateful for um, today. And I'll just say in closing, dying out to self requires a daily intentional and focused effort. And Paul reminds us it will get harder before it gets easier. But the good news is that this word is our anchor and it will help us to overcome those things of pride. You know, our current culture, social media has given us a perfect platform to promote ourselves. And I'm not saying that social media cannot be used for good because I truly believe that it can be. But when you post something on social media, you have to ask yourself, am I posting this from a place of pride or am I posting this from a place of humility? And I'll bet when you do that, you'll find yourself maybe deleting some things before you post them. Um, if you're going back continually to see how many likes, how many shares, you know, how many comments, how many people um, are inter engaged with me on this, perhaps you need to check your spirit. Maybe it's coming from a place of pride, but if you're doing it to lift up and edify others or edify or lift up, you know, uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then by all means, it can be a wonderful tool. We have to be careful with the tools that the world has created, lest they become a stumbling block for us. In closing, Paul's final charge to Timothy is in uh, verses 10 through 15, where he says, Despite all of these things, you, Timothy, know about my teachings. You know my way of life. You know my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance. You've seen me be persecuted in all these places, and yet you've seen the Lord rescue me from all of these. You yourself, Timothy, have lived a godly life. You've been trained in the scriptures from a young age, which is why spiritual mentoring is so important. And, you know, you are able to make wise decisions um, about salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, which is what all of this is pointing to. This entire study from Genesis to Revelation, our word, is focused on pointing to Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He is our salvation. And he is the answer to all of these temptations and all of these false prophets and all of these things. We will stay anchored to this word it is going to draw us closer to Jesus. He's going to draw closer to us. And I will tell you, Paul draws a strong contrast between the false prophets and Paul's ministry. And if you will look in verses down in um, 11, 12, 13, just start to look at some of the contrast that Paul makes, then you will see that he tells Timothy, continue. And I want to leave you today, ladies, with this thought. No matter how bad these end times get, continue because God is your anchor. Thanks and have a great day.